Uh, and it's partly my fault I'm standing here because uh, I thought it might be useful to you to receive a relatively regular update on what's happening with the uh, Brecon cohort because you're all contributing to it and I thank you very much indeed for that. So um, what I want to do is um, to remind you a little bit about how the Brecon cohort works. Uh, and this is our diagnostic database that is um, integrated into SAIL in Swansea University. And the individuals within it are then anonymized, but in a way that allows us to link them to the same individual in other data sets. And we've now started using this to look at things like we've published recently on mortality, on hospital admissions, on the contact that young people are having with their GP in the year up to diagnosis, and on pregnancy outcomes. And what I wanted to share with you today is a presentation that I made to the BSPD uh, relatively recently looking at alcohol-related outcomes. And then, uh, if you'll excuse me, I would also like to finish off with something that's nothing to do with the Brecon cohort, but a brief update on the Usterkids study. So I must acknowledge Andrea Gartner, who's the research associate who's undertaken all the statistical uh, analysis and modelling of this uh, data set. Next slide. So why are we interested in diabetes and alcohol? Well, I probably don't need to tell you, but it's firstly, it's alcohol-related harm is a major policy focus for the Welsh Government. And we know that in young people with diabetes, there's an increased risk of hyperglycemia. But perhaps less well-known, chronic over-ingestion of alcohol is associated with poorer glycemic control, recurrent admissions with ketoacidosis. But we have very little data on how it affects our young people. There are a few anecdotal clinic-based studies published in the literature, but almost no information about how big a, an issue this might be. And it's important because we do focus in the teenagers uh, in educating them about how to drink alcohol safely, but we don't really know if it's working. So what we've been able to do is uh, we linked our Brecon cohort, which at the time of the analysis consisted of over 3,500 people diagnosed with diabetes under the age of 15. And we know it's a pretty complete register of all people with diabetes in Wales. And we have been able to uh, link this uh, to the uh, patient episode database for Wales, which is uh, the database that documents the reason why people have been admitted uh, across uh, Wales. And we've been able to compare how often this occurs uh, with the other 1.8 million people born at the same time who've been living in Wales um, but who do not have diabetes. It's quite a complicated data set to analyse because you have to work out what do you mean by somebody uh, with diabetes. This is easy. Somebody was diagnosed before the Brecon cohort started obviously has had diabetes throughout the whole analytical period. But this individual who's diagnosed halfway through our time period has to be analysed as somebody who did not have diabetes up to the moment of diagnosis but then clearly did after diagnosis until, in that case, they moved out of the area. So we've compared the alcohol-related admissions of those who do not have diabetes with those who do. The statistics that underpin this are complicated, and I don't profess to fully understand them, but it's what's called a multi-failure time-to-event model, uh, the Prentice williams and Peterson total time model. And it stratifies on prior events, and it allows us to look at the influence of age, the influence of social class, and so on. And what we did artificially uh, was to divide our diabetes cohort into two groups. The 40% uh, more deprived on the basis of Townsend scores, and the 60% who were less deprived uh, based on the same scores. So this is the, uh, the, 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 the data set that we've been looking at. So in the type 1 diabetes cohort, you can see that we had 248 hospital admissions during the time period that we undertook this analysis. And this compares with 37,500 admissions with alcohol-related coding in the non-diabetic population. So clearly, uh, this is a cause for concern, and many of our young people are unfortunately being admitted following ingestion of alcohol. So if we take uh, the base risk of being male, you have a reduced risk of being admitted uh, if 
you have diabetes and are a girl. If we take the base case of being admitted as being 11 to 13 years old, then unsurprisingly, these older age groups of individuals with diabetes are significantly more likely to be admitted more than twice, as you can see. There was clearly a social class effect. Those with coming from the more deprived uh, postcodes were more likely to be admitted than those with less deprived postcodes. And the headline figure is that you are 78% more likely to be admitted if you've got diabetes than if you don't. So this slide uh, shows the risks of being admitted uh, by age group along the bottom here. And on the left, we've got those without diabetes. So the base risk is taken to be 11 to 13 years old without diabetes. And we've divided the data into the uh, less deprived, shown as squares, and the more deprived, shown as triangles. And you can see that in non-diabetics, the risk rises through the teenage years and peaks in the young adult 18 to 22 year old uh, age range. And if you come from a, less sorry, from a more deprived background, you have a higher risk of being uh, admitted, up to four times uh, the base case. If you then come to the right here, this shows the data for people uh, with diabetes. And you can see, as you would expect, the very young individuals are very unlikely to be admitted with alcohol-related codes. But then there's a rapid rise. But unlike the non-diabetics, you're more likely to be admitted with diabetes in the 14 to 17-year-old age group rather than the 18 to 22-year-old. And what you can't see in our diabetic cohort is a social class effect. It seems that your increased risks are equally likely whichever deprivation category you come from. But you'll also notice that these numbers here, the, the hazard ratio of being admitted, is significantly higher than if you don't have diabetes. So in conclusion, I think what we've shown is that our young group of people with diabetes have higher and earlier risks of being uh, admitted with alcohol-related coding. Uh, I've shown you data that it peaks at a younger age, 14 to 17 years old. <laughs> And it's made me wonder whether this is because, as paediatricians, we have a reduced threshold for clinically admitting these young people, uh, unlike our adult diabetology colleagues. Uh, it's interesting that we don't see the same effect of deprivation in those with diabetes, uh, but it's disappointing to see this overall increased risk, despite the efforts we've made over the years to educate young people with diabetes to drink uh, safely, and uh, I think it's timely that there's a new education component to Saren coming on stream as I talk, uh, because it would be nice to do better than we do. But maybe it just reflects the problems we have with teenagers, the risk-related behaviour and the challenges we uh, experience in optimising diabetes control um, at this age group. But I think I'd like to suggest it's something we should audit um, and it may be that we need to rethink how we're doing the education uh, around how to drink safely. Um, maybe I should just stop there before I go on to ask the kid, because it's a completely unrelated topic. But I'm happy to take any questions, if any of that is not clear, or any comments. Yeah, we're going to look at the length of time, because there is some suggestion uh, that those with diabetes are admitted for shorter periods than those without diabetes, which might imply a tendency to admit for observation or brief period of observation. Um, I don't think the former are categorised, are they, on PEDU, if you're just seen in casualty and go home from casualty? Well, this is only one measure of alcohol-related harm. There are, of course, many other measures uh, that you could look at, but it's the one that we can most easily access through sale. Um, but you're right, shorter periods of admission might be another measure to look at. Uh, liver disease might be a third. Um, there are many different ways that we could look at it, but we can at least get hold of these data. So it could be that what I'm sharing with you is simply the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I don't know. We haven't, we haven't looked at those. I mean, I, I focused on alcohol, if only because it is, 
it has got specific resonances if you've got diabetes, and we do spend some time trying to help our young people deal with it safely. Um, but I haven't looked at other drugs, and I can't answer that. Well, I think there's probably clinical anxiety. I think we certainly worry, don't we, about the metabolic implications for a young person who's very drunk, who's on insulin. Um, but I don't know. I don't know how we can how we can look at that data with the data set that we've got. I mean, it does suggest we need to be talking about alcohol in the early teens and not leaving it too late. We, I don't think we have the numbers to break it down into meaningful geographical regions, I'm afraid. As you point out, the error bars are quite wide on the data we've got analysed by age group. OK, well, I'll move on quickly because um, I just wanted to finish off by another plug, please, for the Uster Kids study. Um, you'll, I think most of you will be familiar with the Usterkid study. This is a, a randomized controlled trial of a biological agent known as Ustekinumab, targeting 12 to 18 year old young people with newly diagnosed diabetes. You'll all be aware that diabetes is an autoimmune disease and what we're trying to do with this agent is to interfere with the T cell mediated autoimmune destruction of beta cells. The aim is to try and increase the uh, length of the honeymoon period because we know uh, that prolonged periods of really good control may have uh, important implications for your risk of complications later. So it's a double-blind phase two study. I should emphasize that ustekinumab is already in clinical use. It's used in young people with psoriasis and with ulcerative uh, colitis. We're looking to recruit individuals who are within 100 days of diagnosis because we need to get them uh, early and we need to confirm they've got type 1 diabetes with at least one positive antibody and that they've got measurable levels of C-peptide, which is a marker for endogenous insulin secretion following a mixed meal tolerance test. And to encourage people to take part, the randomization is 2 to 1 in favour of ustekinumab. The medication is given by subcutaneous injection at week naught, and then every eight weeks up to 44 weeks. So they get seven injections and the primary outcome a year after starting treatment is the mixed meal tolerance test C-peptide secretion to see to what extent we've been able to preserve endogenous insulin secretion. Next slide. We've got a whole range of other secondary outcomes. Uh, so we're looking at a range of other metabolic endpoints. Um, we're, of course, interested in safety because we're manipulating the immune response, although we believe safety not to be an issue. And we're very interested in the patient-reported outcome measures of both participants and carers. Um, and there are also um, plans uh, to look at other measures of what constitutes endogenous insulin secretion, perhaps using urine samples or dried blood spots taken by patients at home following meals. And we're collaborating with King's College London, who are looking at a whole range of very fancy immune markers that might uh, uncover the pathways that are proving beneficial should astekinumab be proved to be so. So we've now got 14 sites open as of the end of last year and for those of you working in Wales we've got sites in Cardiff, Swansea and Chester um, who will be very happy to uh, receive contact from you. We are aiming to get uh, 72 patients into this study to give it sufficient power. And the update is we've consented 40, so we are about halfway. We've randomised 33. Uh, we've only had to let go of three who didn't have um, either enough uh, endogenous insulin secretion to be eligible or in whom we didn't confirm a diagnosis of diabetes. So you can see that we've now got a couple of individuals who've gone all the way through the trial and increasing numbers at earlier stages in the uh, trial. We lost one patient prior to beginning treatment who changed their minds about taking part in the trial. 
and one patient stopped treatment prior to visit four but has agreed to allow us to continue to collect data on outcomes. So what is the data that we're collecting? Well, the dried blood spots, uh, they're completed weekly up to 28 weeks and then monthly thereafter. And we've managed to get more than 50% adherence to that. We're asking them to wear a Freestyle Libra for at least two weeks before visits. And we've got very good adherence, probably reflecting the fact that this is becoming uh, one of the standard ways of monitoring uh, blood glucose for young people with diabetes. And we've got very good completion of the patient reported uh, outcome measures. So, adverse events. Well, the headline is that so far, touch wood, we've had no serious adverse events or suspected <coughs> adverse reactions to date. We've had 71 adverse events, but these are minor. These are things like headaches and migraine. Um, we've got a pretty good completion of the diaries. And it's really just a plea. If any of you have any newly diagnosed patients who you think might be interested to take part in this study, we're very happy to hear from you. There's my email and phone number. Um, uh, getting your patient involved with the Ustakid trial doesn't mean you lose control in any way clinically of them. We simply <coughs> see them for the screening and the administration of the Ustakinumab, and we refer all queries regarding management back to the uh, referring clinical team. And certainly in Cardiff, we've had seven or eight patients from outside of our area, and I think it's fair to say it's worked um, pretty well. So if any of you have any such patients, if you contact me, I'll give you the website address that patients need to uh, self-refer into the trial through. It contains a video and extra information that gives them a bit of insight and we would warmly welcome uh, their participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.